Hello, I'm Professor McCoy. Uh, for my regular viewers, a bit of a change of scenery, and for my students, even more of a change of scenery. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to be discussing um, Augustine on the nature of the good. Uh, so there's a few areas of this discussion. Um, so this continues uh, from our class discussion um, of McInerney and this Thomistic tradition of ethics, coming at it from a slightly different, uh, slightly different angle, or I guess we could say a slightly different component. Um, so I say slightly different component because uh, the ethics, the the ethical system, and broadly speaking, the the philosophical system we have for uh, from St. Thomas Aquinas, which McInerney writes about, uh, is constructed from the Aristotelian tradition on the one hand, and the Augustinian uh, Christian tradition on the other. So for this text, we're looking at uh, the parts from Augustine, and this plays into a lot of what we've been discussing pretty well. So, I may have to relate. Um, eh, it happens from time to time. In any case, this is, uh, as you may have noticed, this is a bit more casual than a classroom discussion or even uh, one of my well-edited uh, video lectures, partially for time constraints and partially because it's a nice evening out. So, uh, as we go, this may happen. So, anyway, first, I want to set a bit of the historical context uh, for St. Augustine. At the time he was writing this, Augustine was writing primarily against uh, a group of Christian heretics called the Manichees, or the Manichaeans. Uh, we get this uh, into our modern vernacular in the term Manichaean, uh, meaning a kind of dispute between uh, diametrically uh, or metaphysically opposed good and evil, which was part of the Manichaean uh, metaphysical or theological picture of the world. And it's a part that Augustine was vehemently opposed to. So a as Augustine went through his career, uh, he was primarily, uh, or at least his works, were primarily characterized by those he was writing against. So he began writing against the Manichees, and then later on he mostly transitioned to writing against a different group of heretics, the Pelagians. We can discuss that at, uh, at another video if it becomes relevant. As it stands, when he's talking about... Um, the nature of the good, and why this is particularly relevant uh, to the Manichaean question, is because the Manichaeans were most uh, were primarily known um, for a few a few doctrines to do with the metaphysical nature of good and evil. The most interesting of these, and the most unique, and the most that gets sort of carried through, um, I guess maybe sort of through osmosis into our modern understanding is that good is a thing that exists and it's opposed to evil, which is another thing that exists and they're, they're fighting one another. I've discussed this in previous lectures as well. This will be, I'm sure, far from the last time that I speak on this topic just because of this, uh, the nature of the good and its relation, the relationship between metaphysics and ethics uh, and meta-ethics and all these together are really the core of my own scholarly research. So this is bound to come up repeatedly. Um, so as it stands, um, this isn't going to stay lit if I keep talking. <laughs> as it stands, um, the Manichaean idea framework uh, of good and evil is two things with existence and with nature that are opposed to one another. The Augustinian alternative is one where good exists, but evil is better described as a lack of existence. Or the technical term for it is privatio boni in Latin or evil being the privation of good. This is broadly, con this is broadly uh, referred to as the privation theory of evil. Uh, and this is a corollary to the, uh, the metaphysical convertibility of being and goodness, which I've discussed previously. So this means that if something is called good, what that means is 
that it exists. It truly is what it is, and it is itself most fully. By contrast, if something is evil, it means that it's lacking something. So, for Augustine and for the, the tradition that follows, including Aquinas and including, uh, including most of Christian ethics, to say that something is evil is to say that it's lacking something, that it is missing something, that it has less being. What this means is that, that calling something pure evil or evil itself does not exist. So, how does it exist? I'm going to give up on I give up on the, on the pipe. This is not going to work <laughs> while talking. I'll have to slice some coffee. In any case, um, to say that something is pure evil, uh, we use this terminology of something being pure evil or the ultimate evil or um, whatever the case might be. And we can say something sort of like that. We can say that something is a great evil. Using another distinction that Augustine makes here, uh, which is between uh, three different ways that something can be called good or three different ways that something can exist more or less fully. Um, those three are measure, form, and order. So, we talk about something's measure, the measure of something's being, uh, uh, or the measure of, uh, of something's goodness, or its, uh, its greatness. So this is the, the term that gets through into the tradition. So in Anselm, who I've also discussed before, uh, when he talks about God being that than which nothing greater can be thought, this is the notion of greatness that he has in mind. And this is the placement of something in the order of being, so to speak. So this is, um, to say that something is great is to say that it has simply more being according to the kind of thing that it is. So when we talk about something's measure, the measure of something, the measure of something's good, or the measure of something's being, it's talking about the kind of thing that it is. Uh, rather than the individuating characteristics of the particular thing. So in the, case of, um, in the case that Augustine is most interested in, he's talking about the difference between, uh, between brute animals, man, angels, and, uh, and their corollary of uh, demons or devils. Now, when we, say that, um, when we say that something is better than something else, we could mean lots of things. When we say that something has, is greater than something else, or is better in measure, what we mean is that the kind of thing that it is has, uh, has more being. And what we mean by that, we can, we can look to uh, an earlier discussion that we had to do with uh, the different kinds of souls, or the different kinds of natures that something can have. So if you recall, we had this chain of being going up from, uh, from inanimate objects uh, through to plants, um, the plants to animals, like the, the insects you're seeing flying around, and then all the way up to man, or rational animals. Each step up this hierarchy, we add things. We add um, elements of something's nature. We add powers, right? We add uh, causal powers, things that they can do. Uh, so inanimate objects, so um, simple material things, uh, like, let's say a bit of mulch right, off the ground. Right? This is a, an inanimate piece of matter. Right? It has certain powers, like, as we've discussed, so it's, uh, it's capable of producing flames. So if I caught it, if it lit on fire, it would, it would uh, produce heat and light, etc. Uh, and it's also capable of attracting other bodies with mass, right? So because it has physical properties. So if it, I drop it, it falls. As we go up this chain of being, we have things like plants that in addition to all of these uh, basic physical properties, uh, they also have uh, what Aristotle or Aquinas would term a vegetative soul. They have the capacity for nutrition and reproduction. They can take in nutrients and they can produce more of themselves. I'm not gonna go up step by step in this uh, because I've, I've already gone over this in other lectures. Um, if you want a refresher on that, I'll put a, a link below in the description for, uh, for some of the relevant ones. 
But the point is here that each step you go uh, up from inanimate matter uh, up to man, and then ultimately, uh, as Augustine describes in, the, um, in this treatise, all the way up to God, you add new capabilities, new powers, new things about the nature of the thing that we're talking about. Right? So to say that um, a, a, a plant uh, like this orchid is uh, greater than or is, is greater in measure than, say, a rock is to say that it's capable of more things. There's more things that you can truly say about it than you could say about the rock. It's real in more sophisticated ways. So we go, we follow this chain up, and we can say that, um, you know, a human being, such as myself, is greater in measure than a plant, because I'm capable of all sorts of things that the plant is not capable of. Right? And they're different in kind, not just different in degree. And the kind there is the relevant aspect, because that's what measure is talking about. Measure is talking about kinds of things, it's talking about the nature of something. So, measure. Uh, is the greatness of a thing according to its kind uh, or according to its nature. Right? As such, goodness of measure or greatness, uh, as Augustine calls it in some places, uh, greatness is not uh, a moral evaluation. To say that something is greater than something else is not necessarily to say that it's morally better. Because you can have, um, so to speak, a, uh, for example, a bad human being that is, a lot, is morally a lot worse than a really great plant, a really functional plant, right? So the, 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 um, the orchid here, it's doing pretty well for itself, right? Uh, it's, it's growing, it's blooming, it doesn't have a flower, if any flowers at the moment, but uh, it does pretty regularly produce uh, flowers and, um, and it's capable of reproducing itself and it does all of the things that plants are supposed to do and it does them quite well. But a bad person like, uh, like uh, Hitler, Stalin, all, you know, the grand dictators of history are morally evil, but that's not because they are lesser beings than a plant. Right? They have more capabilities, they have more being to them, but there's something else wrong with them. And for that, we have to turn to form and order, which are the other characterizations, uh, or the other evaluations that Augustine presents us with. So the second of these, form. Uh, form is the individual thing, uh, or is, let me say, the degree to which the individual thing conforms, if you will, to its nature. Right. So, um, a plant can be uh, can be well formed, insofar as it's capable of fulfilling its natural capacities. Right. A human being is uh, it is well formed, insofar as we are capable of uh, all of our natural powers, up to and including reason, right? Reason and uh, and uh, socialization. This, too, is not quite a moral evaluation. So we can't say that because something is, uh, is correct in form or incorrect in form uh, that it is necessarily good or evil in the moral sense. We can't blame something necessarily for being um, malformed or deformed. Um, now, it's worth noting at this point that when I use terms like uh, um, deformed or deformities or deformation or malformed. Uh, I'm using them in a really precise philosophical sense here. Uh, similarly, as I'm going to go forward and discuss um, things that are disordered, in other words, things that don't, um, that are ordered improperly. So this third categorization. It's worth noting that, again, this is a very precise philosophical meaning of the term, and I don't want to conflate this with, uh, with say, medical deformities uh, or anything like that, because I don't want to conflate these two things. Uh, there may be some overlap, and, and, I'll, and I'll get into that in a moment, but I want to make clear that what I'm talking about is, uh, is strictly speaking, the, the metaphysical uh, goodness or lack of goodness in a particular way of a particular being. Right? To, so to say philosophically or metaphysically that something is deformed 
Um, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that it is, uh, you know, physically damaged uh, or that it's, um, it's uh, say, like, uh, we, we think of things like a birth defect or something like that. While that may qualify in some limited sense as a deformity in the, uh, in the philosophical sense, uh, it's less meaningful, especially for a human being, because that isn't what's, what's uniquely characteristic of, of humanity. Right? So lack of form or a deformation or a deformity um, in man is, is something that we, we fail to fulfill uh, our nature. We fail to do what our nature would allow us to do. Uh, so this can include things like um, uh, any kind of. Uh, this can include things like disabilities, right? The kind of things that I was mentioning. So, um, so if you have a uh, mental or physical handicap, uh, this would qualify as uh, as a deformity in the philosophical sense. Um, however, again, this that kind of deformity is not. Um, subject to moral judgment. Right? This isn't the kind of thing that we would say is good or evil in the moral sense. Right? It is something wrong with the being in question. Right? It's something that is imperfective of its nature, but it's not um, something that the, the person would be morally responsible for. This is similar to the discussions we've had uh, in the past about uh, about voluntariness, that an, uh, that something carried out involuntarily uh, uh, or ignorantly, say, is not something that can be morally judged. Right? So uh, let's let's move on to to order, because this is where uh, moral judgments really kick in. Uh, then we'll probably have to go back slightly to form, because. If something is morally disordered, right, it can then still have um, some of its deformities in the philosophical sense can in fact be morally culpable. But we'll come back to that because those are those are only indirect and they're only in a narrow range of cases. Okay, so order. The order of something right, is what it is directed towards. It's its characteristic ends, or its goals. Uh, all of this is, is, like the other two, determined by its nature. Uh, however, this is more particular. This is whether certain actions or certain intentions um, uh, are directed towards its characteristic ends or not. So for example, uh, to say that say a human action is disordered is to say that it's it's ordered towards an improper end it's not ordered towards the thing that it's supposed to be ordered towards so to use the example i've used in a previous lecture um, the crab eating its own young right so this this video i showed of the crab eating its own young um, that is disordered behavior right because the eating the the uh, the behavior of cons of taking in nutrients in a particularly animalistic way goes against the both vegetative and animal ends of the organism. So we would say that this behavior is disordered. Now, when this gets into human behavior, because human behavior has an element of rationality, an element of abstraction, an element of choice, at that point we can start putting moral evaluations on a behavior's order, uh, orderliness or disorderliness. Right. So if something is properly ordered towards its, uh, towards its end, uh, towards, say, a human end of um, uh, society or reason or what have you, or, or any of the lower ends, then we will say that it is properly ordered, right? and thus it's a good action. Uh, so a human example is, uh, say, uh, you can think of uh, any really, really particularized um, action uh, like, uh, for example, throwing a punch. Right? We can go to um, um, uh, taking a look at this this particular action of throwing a punch. Okay, 
What is that ordered towards? What is it doing? What, what is the action under a fuller, more robust description? Well, on its face, you're, you're, you're simply speaking, making a fist and thrusting it forward into something. I mean, whether that is an imaginary target, whether that is an assailant, or whether that is a victim. The action seems to be roughly the same. What changes the action is the order. Right? What makes it good or bad is whether it's properly ordered. So if throwing a punch is ordered towards um, victimizing someone or harming someone, uh, harming an, an innocent person, right? then that's disordered. Now, a properly ordered punch would be ordered towards uh, defending someone innocent, whether that's oneself or someone else, um, or it could be ordered towards physical fitness. I mean, if you are punching as part of an exercise, uh, it could be ordered towards training, whether that's uh, training in virtue or whether that's physical training. Um, so uh, teaching, uh, teaching yourself or someone else to throw a better punch, right? teaching, uh, teaching self-defense, teaching fitness, what have you. Right? All these are ordered towards ends which are perfective of the person doing the action. So this is all in contrast to the punching an innocent person example, which is disordered because it's ordered towards the wrong end, an end which isn't aligned with the nature of the person. Um, now we can take this example of throwing a punch, right? and we can look at its, um, its form and its measure as well. So the form of the punch, right? So if you've if uh, if you've studied uh, any martial arts or any uh, even any sports, you know that physical actions have um, have a particular form that they should conform to uh, if they're going to be good examples of that uh, that technique or that maneuver or that whatever. Right? Um, so if you throw a punch and your fist is kind of shaped like this with the hand on the side and your your finger is curved wrong and you throw it really from the shoulder and right, that is a malformed action. Right. Uh, it's an action which it, which doesn't conform to uh, to the nature of the action, right? which is itself then determined by the nature of the actor, by the person making the action. We can also deter. We can also talk about the form. Uh, so sorry. Uh, we can also talk about the the measure of the punch. Right. So a human being throwing a punch is very is different in measure from Superman throwing a punch. Right. They both might have perfect form. They might be. Uh, they might both be properly ordered, but because of their different measure, right? Their different uh, the, the the comparative strengths of the two beings in question, uh, an ordinary human being on the one hand and Superman on the other. Because of the different measures, they're going to have vastly different outcomes. So all three of these aspects uh, change the quality of the thing being done. So now we can kind of come back to looking at the uh, at, at looking at how form can, in some cases, be an indirect uh, be indirectly at least morally evaluated. So if something is deformed, if it has some kind of a deformity, if it isn't formed properly, if it's not a good example of the kind of thing that it is. That can, in some cases, lead to disorders, right? disordered actions. However, in human beings, that is only the case if uh, it leads to intentionally disordered actions. Uh, otherwise, the action is the the fault in the action is enti entirely attributable to the lack uh, or the fault in form. So, again, an example. If someone is, um, if someone is lacking in form in that they are uh, insufficiently rational, right? So, in other words, if someone is is not intelligent, then this can lead to disordered actions if our practical reason, our practical judgments, are uh, misaligned due to a lack in our intellectual capacities, right? So, if I think through a situation and I come to con come to a conclusion about it and I'm not that bright, what that me might mean is I can come to the wrong conclusion about a subject. Right? And that will lead to the objectively wrong action. 
However, as we've discussed already, this would be a fault of ignorance. Right? This would not be a moral fault. But it would still be identical in terms of the action I'm taking and what and uh, the results of that action as if it were immoral. So we have to be very careful about our moral judgments here. Now moving the other direction, looking at how disorder can negatively affect form, this is a little trickier, um, but it involves uh, cases of the development of virtue and vice. Uh, it involves cases that, w uh, that, that you could call um, uh, mutilation of a sort. Uh, and it's a case where a, a particular desire or a particular action is disordered. And so it leads to faults in one's form. Uh, the, the simplest case of this is, um, is if I have the, uh, uh, this is a particularly personal example, I have a particular desire to chew my fingernails. Right? This, is, uh, this is something I've always I've really always done. Uh, it's a habit that I have uh, a lot of trouble getting rid of. Right? And it's a, it, it's a desire, right? I have, um, I have a disordered desire to use my uh, nutritive powers, right? so my, my biting and chewing and swallowing abilities, on the improper object, namely my fingernails. Right? That is the kind of thing that should be used for coffee or for food or for you know, something that will provide nutrition. Right? So if I order that power towards chewing my fingernails, towards something that's ultimately self-destructive. What I'm doing there is I'm doing something wrong, right? something morally wrong. Now, what that leads to is a very minor deformity right? in the philosophical sense. What it leads to is my incapacity to use my fingernails as they ought to be able to be used. right? So I can't, um, if I've been really biting my fingernails a lot lately, um, then I can't um, I can't scratch things, or I can't peel things, or I can't open certain things. Right? Things that I ordinarily ought to be able to do with my fingernails, I'm no longer capable of doing. So here we have um, a disordered action leading to um, a fault in my form. We can think of co uh, copious examples of these. Right? There's lots of examples of this sort of thing where uh, we're desiring something wrong, right? so a disorder uh, can lead to a deformity. Right? So, so um, wanting to uh, wanting to um, it, here we go. Wanting to uh, or maybe not wanting is the better way of saying it. So, not wanting to learn, right? Not wanting to learn things is likely to lead to a lack of form of one's intellect. Right, so if you if you uh, if you refuse to learn, if you refuse to take in new information, right, then you're going to intend you're you're going to be making the same mistakes, even though you could have prevented it. So here we have what becomes a moral failing, right? Because then the the the, the subsequent the subsequent faulty actions that arise from this lack of form, whether that's my fingernails, right, my incapacity to open things or scratch things on the one hand, or whether it's bad decisions we make um, out of a, a lack of knowledge that we could have chosen to acquire, <clears throat> those are now morally culpable faults because we could have and ought to have rectified them. Or in other words, because they arose from um, a fault in order and not just a fault in form or measure. So, if we take this a step further and we look at formation of virtue, virtue, um, or uh, having a morally good character, if you will, uh, is part of form. So if you are vicious, if you have certain vices, if you have bad habits, if, you have, uh, if there are certain things that you, um, you shouldn't do, but you do anyway, right? Uh, that is a fault in form. Now, the reason we usually blame these things, or we think we see them as morally culpable, is because habits always arise from actions. Right? My habit of biting my fingernails, uh, which is maybe a, a kind of vice, is not a. Uh, it didn't come from nowhere. This had to come from uh, me starting to do it at some point, right? 
So I chose to bite my fingernails and then it became a habit. Now I just do it without thinking. Even if I don't do it intentionally in every case, oh, sorry about that, Sirs is inside yelling. Um, sorry, anyway, anyway uh, even if I do it, don't do it intentionally in every case, <clears throat> um, it is still, the habit is still something that I intentionally formed. Uh, whether through a series of intentional actions that that culminated in a sort of involuntary, uh, or I guess maybe I should say non-voluntary um, habit, or whether it is something that I, I chose to form into a habit right, intentionally. And this can go both ways. This is why v uh, virtues, so good habits, uh, good habits of character, um, are morally praiseworthy. This is why we praise courage Right? So, for example, the courage to jump into danger without even thinking to do the right thing, even if that's not fully deliberate and intentional, even if we didn't think it all the way through from the start, that is still the kind of action which is morally praiseworthy because it arises from a virtue that we've intentionally cultivated through a series of rightly ordered actions. Okay, so to summarize, let's... Uh, let's uh, let's go back to the beginning and sum up from the start. So to begin with, we talked about um, Augustine's idea of the privation theory of evil and the nature of good as being and being construed in certain ways. So what this means is that to say something is good is to say, is to say that it is. It is fully itself. It's something that it should have. Right? So um, to say that it's, it is, um, it's, Morally bad is to say that it's it it lacks something that it as the kind of being that it ha it is should have and that means that it does things that it should not do or doesn't do things that it should do. So he breaks this uh, this being this chain of being this this, um, this this evaluation of being into three parts: uh, measure, form, and order. Uh, the measure is what kind of thing something is, how great the kind of thing is, the nature of the thing. Form is how, uh, is how well a particular thing conforms to that nature, right? how fully it fulfills that nature, how close it is to being an exemplar of its kind, say. And then order, uh, which is whether the particular actions or aspects of a thing conform to its characteristic ends. Uh, or its intentions or its goals. All right. Hopefully this clarified uh, and expect another lecture up very shortly um, on uh, Ethica Thomistica by Ralph McInerney. Uh, we're going to be looking at the chapter on good and evil acts and how particular acts and uh, the nature of action will fit into this framework. Uh, so until then, I'll see you later.